my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Well, yesterday we had uh, a beautiful lightning storm that came through and it knocked out our internet. And it's kind of different living life without TV or internet. Yes, I was in heaven actually, but anyway. Um, I have a funny joke. Well, I think it's funny, so I pray that you will. There was this battleship sailing off the Atlantic, and it's coming across, and it's at night, and it sees this light in front of it. So the radio man gets up there, the, 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 uh, uh, the officer of the deck gets up there and says, hey, uh, ship in our vicinity, uh, veer off to the port 40 degrees and make way for the U.S. naval ship. So a voice comes back over the line, no, I suggest that you veer to the port 40 degrees. So this dance goes on about three or four times. So finally the, 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 the watch officer, he goes and wakes up the CO. And those of you that have been on, on the uh, watch, you understand this. So the CO gets on the radio and says, you don't understand who this is. This is Captain Spinatz of the USS uh, Bag of Donuts. We're the biggest battleship in the fleet. You veer off to your port 40 degrees and leave way for us to come through. So Radium gets on the other end. He goes, well, this is Petty Officer First Class Bag of Donuts, and this is Lighthouse Bag of Donuts, and if you keep going straight, you're going to hit the rocks. <laughs> There's a certain amount of truth to sometimes on do we give for what ourselves are over to where God is. Are you going to be like that battleship captain and do what you want, what you think, or are you going to give way to where God wants? And he is that lighthouse. I want to read from this James reading as we're going through this. I want you to look at basically um, the 13th verse through the end. And I'm going to read it to you from uh, Eugene Peterson's version called The Message. And those of you that don't have it, it's a, it's a great, uh, by, a, a God-fearing uh, translation of the Bible. He puts it into a, a modern vernacular. And he says it this way, as you can read along and, and listen to what he said. And now I have a word for those who, are bra that who brashly announced today at, le at the latest tomorrow, we're off to such and such a city for a year. We're going to start a business and make a lot of money. And James goes into saying, you don't know the first thing about tomorrow. You're nothing but a wisp of fog catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Instead, make it a habit to say, if the master wills it and we're still alive, we'll do this or do that. And then in the end here, I think this is the most important part. As it is, you are full of your grandos selves. All such vaunting self-importance is evil. The fact if you know the right thing to do and don't do it, that for you is evil. This is vital to who we are as a church. If, and, 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 and as a disciple, you're given choices. Now, the first part of this reading here, we talked about last week, about the judging part. But, but really, in, in verse 13 through 15, that's based to people that are business people. That's really who he's writing to. You, you know, you're going to go over here and make some money. But, I mean, I don't want to transcribe Scripture to say, well, if I put this word here, because then I become just as evil as the people that say, well, you know, you really didn't mean this about marriage, or you really didn't mean this about the sanctity of life if we throw this word here. So we really shouldn't get into that practice. But we can use as a business leader as we are as a church. In, in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the, to the Universe, the, I love that book. If you've not read it, it's, it's, watch the movie. Then Disney did a great job on, on the, it, the, 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 the famous line that we all know from, from years ago was, uh, you know, the, the, the best laid plans of mice and men. 
Well, in the Hitchhiker's Guide, they say the best laid plans of mice, because mice are the smartest being in the world, that we're really here for their experiments, you know, and that's, that's the whole premise of this thing. And it makes it really fun to, to, to relook at the world uh, that way. Uh, and dolphins are actually smarter than we are, and they all jumped off the earth because the earth was going to be blown up, and, and they said thanks for all the fish. That was the last thing they said as they flew up into space. I mean, this is funny stuff if you were there, but you're not seeing it as funny. That's okay. Um, but the, the point is here is that the best laid plans that we can lay out, we don't know what tomorrow brings if we follow our own desires. Whereas God, if we pray through everything, we hear the Holy Spirit saying, go here, go there, let's get wheelchairs, let's, let's do this, or let's go pray for this person, or, you know, I don't know why, but the Holy Spirit told me to call that person. That is where you're so, you're getting that yourself into a level that you're hearing the Word of God in your conversation with God. And He's letting you know what His plan is for your life. Your plan for your life, you, you think... I got all this stuff set up. I'm going to do the following things. We've seen this this past week. Oh, yeah. I got this promotion, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And then all of a sudden, boom, everything is flipped over. Everything is flipped over. And it could be because of a sickness. It could be because of a death in the family. It could be because of financial. Whatever the case may be, we have to really get ourselves out of the habit of saying, well, I'm going to plan out the following things, and it's going to work out. Now, in the Marine Corps, I was a logistics chief. I, was, I, I, carried, I took care of <clears throat> the beans, bolts, and band-aids. That's the way I best looked at, at logistics. Beans, bolts, and band-aids. You worried about everything behind the scenes so that combat could happen. Now, the, the thing was, is at, in logistics, there's 10 people in the Marine Corps supporting one infantry guy. 10 people. That's your medic, your corpsman, uh, or your, your chaplains, your supply types, your food service guys, your, you know, I mean, you go through, you, you start looking at who, who supplies the electricity, who supplies the tent, who supplies the food, who supplies the gas for the vehicles, who supplies the vehicles, who supplies the, the maintenance on the vehicles, right? Who's my armor? Who takes care of my M16? Who orders the ammo that I'm firing out my guns? Who gets my uniforms? Who makes sure my uniforms are clean? And so you start to see where those 10 folks add up real quick in the Marine Corps to that one person. And as a logistics chief, I had the art of saying, okay, the, the, the strategist, we call him, the, 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 the one infantry guy, would come down, this is our plan, we're going to attack a uh, bag of donutsville at noon tomorrow. We need the following supply items. Well, if you followed that list, as most did, the problem ran into is what happens if all of a sudden tomorrow it rains? You didn't plan for that, did you? You planned for here was your parameter type idea. Well, what happens if tomorrow all of a sudden we hit uh, a bridge that we can't build? So you see how the, the art of knowing these 10 people and how to get them orchestrated for that one person to get them to work the right way. So as a logistics chief, I used to drive my COs crazy. I would pack up a five ton like it's loaded for, we're going to the Arctic and then the next week we're going to the Sahara and then the week after that we're going to Panama. Well, wait a minute, Gunny, we're just going out here. You don't know what's gonna happen. And that's why I was one of the most decorated and promoted the fastest as logistics chief. I drove my logistics guys crazy because I had them packing for the Arctic, the desert, and the jungle all in the same place. <coughs> but I had enough fallback stuff that in case of something happened, we were covered. And we could keep going with what his primary objective was to take Spinotsville. Because I understood this reading as a Marine. Now, I can't plan what's going to happen tomorrow. And I'm sure that if God was up there, he's saying, well, listen, I'm not going to give you my grandiose plan as to how you're going to win in combat. And I think that's the last thing that God really wants is for us to fight. But I understood his word enough to use it in how we did stuff in the Marine Corps. But that's the same way we have to be with our lives. 
Because too often we get ourselves so caught up in this is what I have to do as a Christian that we forget about the other variables. What happens when all of a sudden you have to go up and evangelize to somebody? You're talking to them on the street, and, and all of a sudden you, you get a, a smell of them, they smell like alcohol. Does that stop everything? Your plan was, I'm going to go out and evangelize today. But all of a sudden a variable comes in. Or she invites or he invites a friend over to talk. Are you going to be able to talk to two people? So listening to God then means that you have to be open up to whatever he puts in front of you that day. And this is vital to who we are as Christians. If you have a day so set up saying, today it's church, I'm done with church, I'm going to go home, I'm going to make a sandwich, I'm going to take a nap, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Then all of a sudden there's that call at 12 o'clock that you didn't listen to God about. Oh, hey, can you come over? We need to talk. I, I, I got some, something I need to talk to you about. A family member or a friend. So you see how God works sometimes is that if we allow ourselves to have him in our day, in our prayers, every single day, have that in your plan. God, I'm allowed today to be where you want me to be. I want to take a nap if that's okay with you. And prayerfully, you close the door and the phone doesn't ring during your nap. Or as Derek tried to call me yesterday and I had on silent. So the Lord was telling me to take a nap, Derek, sorry. But you see what I'm saying, though? And I pray that this is getting through to you, is that what James is trying to do through Proverbs is we need to watch. And, and if God presents something to us, is what he's closing with here. If you're all boasting is evil, if anyone who knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it is a sin for themselves. So what James is saying there is very much like Peter, Peterson says. If your self-importance is evil, the fact that you know what the right thing to do and you don't do it is for you is evil. If all of a sudden God presents to you, go here, and you say, I'm going to hold off. I'll do it later. That's evil in God's eyes. Let me give you an example. When I first started as a parish priest, and I was ordained, it seems like forever, um, but I was in Connecticut, and my mentor was Ron Gaps. He's, he's, a, he's a priest up in Connecticut. And I got a call to go to the hospital, and he said, you need to go now. I was like, Ron, you know, I, I got stuff, and I had a whole myriad, a list of stuff that I had to do. He said, just take my word for it, we'll talk about it later, I'll take care of that stuff, but go to the hospital now. So I went to the hospital to visit this parishioner, and she passed away the day, a day later. So I get back to talk to Ron, and I said, what's going on? Why, why did you push me so much in this thing? He says, let me tell you what I did as a parish priest when I first got here. The Holy Spirit told me to go visit Mrs. Bag of Donuts. And I put it off for the stuff that a normal parish priest has where, you know, you got to worry about this administration and that administration. And uh, Tuesdays are my, my hospital day, and I'll get over there Tuesday. So he was going to go over there the next day and visit me. Great parishioner, she died before he got there. And the guilt that he carries to this day from this reading, the evil, the, he knew what to do was right. She had called him and said, listen, Ron, I, I really need you to come over because I think I'm going to need last rites. This is not feeling good. And she, she died of, of uh, pancreatic cancer. It, that's what the problem is. If we know what is good, we have to do it. Don't just put a blind eye to it and say, I'll, I'll get to it later. Because that chance may not be there again. If you evangelize, if all of a sudden somebody comes up to you, hey, I want to know what a good Christian is. If you let that chance go, say, well, how about we talk about that after church? Or let's talk about that later on when I get back to you. You don't know what's going to happen. That person needed you. God put that person in your life right there and right then for a reason. Now, how are you going to dance that dance before the Lord? How are you going to dance that dance before the Lord? Imagine if Jesus, I mean, Jesus said the same thing in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if you take this cup from me, if, if, if this can pass, I would love it. I'll put off going to Calvary tomorrow. But he didn't. He knew, what his, he knew what his job was, and that was to carry that cross that Friday to the top of that mountain 
and to die for us. He could have put it off. He could have. He knew what was going to happen, but he didn't. And that's where we have to live our lives, to know that God's timing is not always ours and that we need to be open to when and what happens in our lives and say, okay, you put this in front of me right now. How am I going to deal with it? Help me through with this thing. Because it's your doing, not mine. It's your doing. You, you want me here for a reason. How, what are you going to do out of this? What, what can I, good can I do for you out of this situation that I'm in right now? That is showing God a true disciple. And I pray that this is uh, helping you in some way to understand what a disciple is about. It's not an easy road. Nobody ever said when you became a Christian, things were going to get better. Anybody that did is a fool. Anybody that ever told you that, oh, well, once you're a Christian, everything's fine. No. It's worse. It's worse. And, and when somebody says, well, Jesus, you know, being a Christian is for losers, you're right. Admitted losers. But I'm going to win in the end. So, then nah. <laughs> That's the way to look at it, you know? I mean, it doesn't, nobody ever said being a Christian is going to be easy. It's not. It's not easy. And, and God's timing, if you're listening to him, he's going to give stuff to you that you don't think you can handle. But you got through it. How many of you at your ninth grade algebra test said, I can't do this? But you did it. It was that easy. You did it. So think next time as, as God calls you to something. And, and don't call wrong right. If God has told you to do something, do it. Don't put it off. Because then you become that sin. You become evil because you knew what was to do and you decided you were going to do it on your own either way. So listen to the Lord this week. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.